reading through the Bible in a year, February 6th, Genesis 39, Mark chapter 9, Job 5, and Romans chapter 9. Now, Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an uh, officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. And Yahweh was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that Yahweh was with him, and that Yahweh caused all he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, Yahweh blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of Yahweh was on all that he had, in house and in field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness? And sin against God. And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there uh, in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garments in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that uh, he had left his garment in her hand and he had fled out of the house, She called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought uh, among us a Hebrew to laugh at us, and he came to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant who you have brought among us, came into me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way that your servant treated me, his anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, and the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But Yahweh was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And all, rather, and the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because Yahweh was with him. And whatever he did, Yahweh made it succeed. That's all the notes to hear. Let's move on to Mark chapter 9. Continuing from yesterday. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as uh, no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, Elijah representing the prophets, Moses representing uh, the law, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents or tabernacles or booths, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen 
until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why do the scribes say that Elijah first uh, must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how it is uh, written of, of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to, uh, to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Remember that the uh, apostles and the disciples had been given um, special power to uh, cast out demons and to heal people and so forth. But while Jesus was on the mountain, this perplexing one came to them, and they couldn't do it. So the prevailing thought here is that the, um, uh, the, the, the scribes here... Um, these are people who are experts in the law, were mocking them, saying that they couldn't save this person, like they don't have the power within themselves, which is true, and mocking the power of Christ that they couldn't save this one person. That's the prevailing thought that we have on this. Let's continue on. And Jesus answered them, verse 19, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? He said, From childhood. And it often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can? All things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, boy was like a corpse, so most of them said, he he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. Remember, they were expecting Jesus to be this conquering, ruling king, and he was going to come in and overthrow the Romans and any other power over the Jews. That's what they expected to see happen. And here Jesus is telling them what is going to happen, and they're perplexed about it. They they don't understand why this is. Let's continue on. Verse 33. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Again, they expected Jesus to come into his kingdom, and they're competing amongst themselves for who's going to have the highest offices within this new kingdom. But they... Uh, rather, verse 35, And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child uh, and put him in the midst of them. And taking him into his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. John said to him, Teacher, We saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. 
For one who does a, a mighty work in my name, brother, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon be able afterward to speak evil of me. For one who is not against us is for us. Truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go into hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin. Hold on. There's a large section of notes in the middle here. and I'm waiting for it to go through. I want to make sure we don't lose that one. Here we go. Back to the text. Verse 47. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the rather where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves. And be at peace with one another. Bringing up a map here of Jesus' final journey into Jerusalem. There we go. And now moving on to Job chapter 5. Eliphaz the Temanite continues. This is after he was uh, giving a, um, a report of this whispering that came to him in his sleep of a shadowy figure who was prompting him about Job to ask him questions about Job. Like pushing him to say, does this man really think he's righteous? Has anyone who has ever uh, suffered as he has not been a man in deep sin? Again, this is why I believe, may not be what most people believe, but I'm cool with that. Um, this is what I believe is Satan tempting Job's friends against him in order to set them against him, to push him to sin or to push him to lie or to try to get him to um, sin against God. Because remember, the whole cause for all of this isn't something that Job has done, but it's a, it's a kind of battle between God and Satan. Where God is saying, look at this. There's someone who serves me as he should. And Satan's like, well, yeah, he's only doing that because you've done good things for him. This takes us to where we are now. Verse 1. Eliphaz continues, the friend of Job. Call now. Is there anyone who will answer you? To which of the holy ones will you turn? Surely vexation kills the fool, and jealousy slays the simple. I have seen the fool taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling. His children are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate, and there is no one to deliver them. The hungry eat his harvest, and he takes at rather, and he takes it even out of thorns, and the thirsty pant after his wealth. Like, look, the minute someone does something wicked, God will crush that person and take everything that he has away, making the direct accusation that that's what happened to Job. Job must have been a great sinner for all of these horrible things to happen to him. That's the implication he's saying here. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground, but man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. As, as for me, I, I would seek God, and to God would I commit my cause, who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. He gives rain on the earth. He sends waters on the fields. He sets on high 
those who are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and these schemes of the wily are brought to a quick end. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noonday as in the night. But he saves the needy from the sword of their mouth, from the hand of the mighty. So the poor have hope, and injustice shuts her mouth. Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. Once again, saying that he must have done something wrong to cause this to happen. For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. He will deliver you from six troubles. And in seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine, he will redeem you from death and in war from the power of the sword. You shall be hidden from the lash of the tongue and shall not fear destruction when it comes. At destruction and famine, you shall laugh at, and not fear, rather, and shall not fear the beasts of the earth. For you shall be in league with the stones of the field. And the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. You shall know that your tent is at peace, and you shall inspect your fold and miss nothing. You shall also, or know also, that your offspring shall be many, and your descendants as the grass of the earth. You shall come to your grave in a ripe old age, like a sheaf gathered up in its season. Behold, this we have searched out, it is true. Hear and know it for your good. So, what are they doing? They're accusing him of great sin because he's had great troubles and great struggles. I hate to give you too much foreshadowing, but that's how basically the rest of this story goes as his friends repeatedly come to him with you know, these accusations against him. And Job keeps replying that he's done no wrong, that he only seeks to speak with the one Sorry, it's with, with his Redeemer. It's a great book. We'll get there. Let's go ahead and conclude today in Romans chapter 9. Paul continues, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. I, I, I could wish that I myself were accursed, as in cast off and going to hell, and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He's talking about the Jews. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, because the Jews refuse to accept it. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Meaning, just because they are the genetic descendants of Abraham, this doesn't mean that they are of the uh, people of Israel, of the promise of Israel. But, quote, through Isaac shall your, shall your offspring be named. Abraham had many children. We read about that. First Ishmael, then Isaac, the child of promise. And then with his, um, after his wife died, he had you know, other children with other people. And he sent them all off. All of them became kind of their own nation, but it's only through Isaac that the promise was made. Verse 8, this means that it is not the children of the flesh, the genetic descendants of Abraham, who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. This is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. 
And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Again, going back to that golden chain of redemption we read at the end of chapter 8. She was told, Rebekah was told, the older will serve the younger. Again, in the natural way of things, that wasn't how things went. The firstborn was the one who got the lion's share of the property, and they got all of the, um, the, the fame and the honor and everything else. But here, God said that it is the younger that shall rule. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Literally asking, if God so chooses one over another, and if, as the humanists say, well, we're all equal, it's true. We all equally deserve damnation. All of us have equally sinned against God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one who does righteously. No, not one. Our heart is a a sinful, wicked thing. No one knows it. No one can know your own heart. It's deceitful above all things. Yeah, that's absolutely true. All of us deserve damnation. But what do we see instead? That God gives mercy. So, is God wrong in doing this? That's the question being asked in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part for choosing one instead of another? By no means. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. God raised up Pharaoh for the singular purpose of glorifying himself through the destruction of Pharaoh and the destruction of Pharaoh's armies. We aren't quite there yet. We get to that in Exodus. We'll get there soon. Verse 18, so then, he, God, has mercy on whomever he, God, wills. And he, God, hardens whomever he, God, wills. Reading it again, so then, God has mercy on whomever God wills, and God hardens whomever God wills. We are God's creation. We are the work of his hands. He can do with us whatever he pleases. Paul dials into that here. Well, you will say to me then, well, why does he still find fault if he hardens one and saves another? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded, say to its molder, why have you made me thus? Why have you made me like this? Has, has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another vessel for dishonorable use. This is the same thing we see every single day in the news when people rail against God because God made me wrong. Who are you, O man or woman or Z or Zer or whatever? To accuse your creator. God hardens whom he wills, he saves whom he wills, to his glory, not our own. Our own punishment we deserve, we righteously deserve, we rightfully deserve the punishment that we will receive if we are outside of Christ. And if we are in Christ, Jesus took our sin upon himself. We don't deserve for him to do that. We aren't good people by nature, and therefore he has chosen us. He didn't look down the corridor of time to go, he might choose me at some point down in the future, so I'm going to choose him who has already chosen me in the future, and then he's going to... No. 
We don't see that in scripture at all. What do we see instead? God is the one who chooses. We're going to roll back for a second. Roll back more. There we go. Verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. What is this calling? For those whom he foreknew. This is that. He chose us ahead of time before the foundation of the universe. He chose us before he did anything either good or bad. He foreknew. He also predestined. He set our destiny in stone before the first Adam was formed in the universe. And he predestined us to be conformed into the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. That's that effectual calling. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also It's read here as past tense glorified. We have this glorification when we pass through that veil of death and enter into eternity with Christ. But it's read here as past tense because in our experience, it's still within that temporal realm where it's something that's still going to come to us in the future. But to God who exists in eternity where time doesn't exist, we have all ready been justified. We have already been glorified. Back to the text. Back to verse 20. But, but rather, verse 21. Has the potter no right over the clay? God is our creator. This is a direct relation to us. Remember, we were formed, as we read in Genesis, we were formed out of the dust. We were hand-formed by God into our bodies, and then he breathed life into us. Do we have any right to complain and say, why don't I have wings? Why? I get bored all the time. If I had a second head that had its own conscience I could talk to, I would hate myself, but I would still have something that's more interesting than being bored all the time. Has the potter, has our creator, no right over us, his clay, to make out of the same lump One vessel for honorable use and one vessel for dishonorable use. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? These are the people who we see hating God, railing on God every single day, chasing down whatever it is they can do, whatever depravity they can get their hands on, uh, mocking God in all that they do. Mocking their creator, even though we read in Romans chapter 1 that they already know their sin. And they know that it's wrong to do these things. They not only do them, but they give their approval to those who practice them. What if God has endured with much patience these vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? So that, for the purpose of, in order... To make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. He's the one who chose us, uh, but before time and the universe began, before we ever did any good deeds, he knew who he wanted to choose. It's that golden chain of redemption we read before. Even us, the elect, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also the Gentiles. This is the mystery. For a Jew, this is, this is blasphemy. In fact, numerous times we saw Paul getting attacked for the blasphemous utterance of saying that God, Yahweh, Jehovah, is also the God of the Gentiles. The same people that the Jews hated. The same people that the Jews mocked. 
Occasionally, they would allow a proselyte to come in, but even if they did, they weren't seen as a full-class Jew. They were a lower-class Jew because they weren't born from the, from the breeding stock of Abraham. They were missing the truth about God this whole time. As indeed, he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And to her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them shall be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring. We would have been like Sodom, become like Gomorrah. Absolutely, positively wiped from the earth. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith? But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, as in if they keep the law, then they can obtain it on their own, did not succeed in reaching that law. They made an idol out of the law itself. They changed the rules. That's what, that's what Jesus got so mad about. That they took the law, which is good. It points to the Christ. It points to the fact that we still need a redeemer. They took this law, which is good. And what did they do with it? They added their own works to it. They added their own standards. They added their own requirements upon this law. In so doing, they stripped the power of the law. They also shaved off all the hard parts. That's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, in the Beatitudes, he shocks the people by revealing to them the truth of the commandments of God. And he keeps it as, as flat and earthly as possible. You have said it heard of old, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, Again, standing on the mountain, speaking as God to the people. If you look with lust, you have already committed adultery in your heart. You've heard, uh, you've heard it said of old, you shall not murder. But I say to you, if you are angry without cause, you are guilty of hellfire. Because you've committed murder in your heart. This is why Jesus had to tell them the truth. Because they had completely forsaken it. In pursuit of their own worldly, earthly religion. Verse 32. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith but as if it were based on works. Once they shaved off the hard parts of the law, they're like, yeah, I can do that. Oh, I just won't sleep with anyone who's not my, uh, who's not my wife or not my husband. What I do in the playground of my mind, on the other hand, yeah, I'm going to look at that girl. I'm going to have dirty thoughts about her in the back of my head. That is the same thing as committing adultery physically. God's standard is so high that even our thought life is counted as if we've actually completed the act. And this wasn't being taught to the people. They weren't being taught to live in the fear of God. They were being taught to live in the careful respect of God. They did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, 
and whoever believes in him, so that faith will not be put to shame. That's it for today. That's all the reading and all the notes. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold, word of the Lord.